I'm Thomas Duran. I'm going to talk about Sensu here for a moment. Um, basically, Sensu is a monitoring framework that we are starting to use at GoDaddy for monitoring our servers. Uh, it works on Linux and Windows uh, running on Ruby. Um, I'm a site reliability engineer at GoDaddy, and you can find me on Twitter at LiveAndGeek. Although I don't use it that frequently, I will get the messages. Uh, this is our legal warning that legal had me put in here. Um, I am not a representative of GoDaddy today. Everything is my own opinion. So if you hate this talk, then um, don't blame them by many domains and hosting from GoDaddy. So at GoDaddy, we had a problem. Um, we had spent many years with monitoring where instead of fixing the basic infrastructure that we had, we brought on new pieces. And those new pieces were run by a single team of two guys. And anytime anybody needed something, you contacted those two guys. And if you were lucky, two weeks later, you had a monitor. It was awesome. Um, so no teams had any control over it. It didn't assist in any kind of automation. If it had an API, great. You could tap into it and do something. And because it took so long for the monitoring team to do anything, we had a ton of noise where people just didn't want to deal with their monitors. They just leave them up there. So you have a two-year-old monitor that you call somebody every Friday night on, and they don't care. Um, and there was no central dashboard. There's about six or seven different tools that the NOC will load up uh, any time that there's an incident. And there's probably one guy in the NOC who knows how to use all of those tools. So it's uh, kind of a disaster when those types of things happen. So we sat down and decided we need to get something better. Um, we need to do something different. And uh, so we sat down, what do we want to do for monitoring? Now, there's plenty of talks online about monitoring. One of the most important things is making it composable. You want all these pieces to work together so that if something dies, something best of breed new comes out, you rip it out, you put the best of breed in, nothing else cares. We wanted to be open source, and because of that, we wanted it to have a good community. We needed to work on multiple OSs because a lot of our backend stuff runs on Linux. Front of site runs on Windows, so we needed it to work on a lot of different things. Um, we also needed people to be able to self-manage with it, automate around it, and of course, we needed it to be available 100% of the time. Um, one thing with our main monitoring that we use today, Spectrum, it runs a cold standby. So basically, if it goes down, we call a guy, we get a hold of him in 5, 10 minutes, he gets online, he switches over to the other server, and then we're back online. So we didn't want to live like that anymore. So Sensu was uh, one of the main things that we tapped into. Uh, Mike McLean, who works at GoDaddy, was already working on Sensu for the hosting world. And we found that a couple of other teams were investigating it for their own local checks and things for their applications. So we liked it because it was open source, has a huge community around it where we can tap into checks. Um, it also can utilize Nagios checks. So with a simple wrapper, we could tap into thousands of checks right there without having to write anything extra. Um, we could make it highly available, and it would allow the way that we construct it for self-management from different teams so that teams could just run their own checks, do whatever they want. And, of course, it fits into a composable framework because it does checks. That's all it does. It will take data, push it out, and then you're done. So if we needed to replace it with something such as console or remon, we could replace it with that very easily. So this is what a basic check in Sensu looks like. Um, it's just a JSON file that uh, basically says, hey, I'm going to run something. I want to check for running process. I'm going to name it chef underscore client. So um, I kind of mishmashed this one. That should not say chef underscore client. This is actually a cron D check. So as you can see, the next command is going to check for cron D. So terrible naming convention. But um, basically, it'll check the process. If there's more than one running, throw a critical error. And then just make sure that cron is running. And you can see the interval every 60 seconds. We have it as a subscriber for a production system. So any clients that we need running cron D, they subscribe to this check, and they'll automatically get it. Uh, there's multiple handlers. So if we want to push a notification out to IRC and say, hey, cron is not running on this server, go ahead and fix it. But even better, we have a remediator that can also go out and say, hey, cron is not working. Kick it. Is it working now? Great. So we'll just easily restart a service. And this is what the backend architecture of Sensu looks like. Um, basically, here you have the Sensu server, which communicates to the clients via Rabbit. 
each client that subscribed to a different check will receive those checks and the server will tell it to run via rabbit. It will send back via rabbit into the server. The server stores the state of the last 20 events for each server in Redis. And then the API will actually front Redis so you can tap into it via a REST API very easily to go ahead and ch see what checks there exist, clients that exist, any events that are going on, anything, any kind of information that you want to get from Sensu is available via the API. And this is what the dashboard that Sensu recommends looks like. This is the Uchiwa dashboard. It's got uh, taps into the API so you can maintenance alarms, see any events that are going on. These are four events that are going, a couple critical, a couple that are uh, just minors. But the nice thing that we found about Uchiwa, especially as far as the NOC is concerned, if we have multiple systems for Sensu living out there, Uchiwa taps into any API that we want. So let's say we have five servers on the back end. Uchiwa taps into those five APIs and will actually cache that data for 10 seconds. So we have 20 clients on the front end hitting Uchiwa. That's 20 requests, not 100 requests out to the APIs behind it because Uchiwa is handling all of that for us, caching it for 10 seconds, feeding the data to the clients, feeding it there. So it's 25 requests instead of 100. So at scale, especially when we start getting into, we have 30 or 40 teams that we're going to have, that really helps with us to be able to scale this out a lot better. So everything that you just saw can run on a single box. If you want to go grab Sensu, they have a, an omnibus package that you can just install it on your Linux machine or if on a Windows machine if you like dancing with the devil. And um, says the guy with a Mac. But the... Um, the thing is, is that you can get it up and running. You can check things on your own systems. I've started using it home just to play around with, so my test systems actually are monitored just for fun, so I can get a text to myself if something goes down. Not that it really matters. So we came up with a high availability infrastructure for it. Basically, what we have is the clients connect to everything via public VIPs. Those public VIPs then route into our Rabbit instances. And those Rabbit instances connect directly to our Sensu servers, of which we have two. So that handles one piece of availability for us, that if we need to do maintenance on one side, we can. B side still running. We're great. What about when a team deploys a check that matches the name of another team's check and kills everything? So what we decided to do was is we ha are utilizing KVM to break up the single server into multiple instances. With the hardware we're running, we break it up into eight instances, and each team gets their own instance. So if team one is on uh, Sensu server 1A and 1B, and they break something, we work with that team to fix it, and the other seven teams have no idea anything's going on. Likewise, if they do something that starts burning up the CPU, they're rate limited, nobody else notices. Um, we also have Keep Alive D running on the Sensu boxes, so the API, uh, Redis, everything on the back end is uh, working there as well. And uh, currently we're using Redis Sentinel uh, for our replication for Redis, which allows us to have a master uh, set up and it will automatically fail over and fail back over as things occur. I know that it was just announced today that Redis 3.0 release candidate one is out, which has Redis cluster. So hopefully in the future, we can actually cluster that out. So how do we deploy the systems? Um, basically, what we've done is, is we use KVM. We found a Perl script on GitHub called SnapGuest that allows us to configure the network before the first boot takes our base image, does a copy on write, creates a new base image for it, changes our network around, loads up, and on that first load allows us to run any scripts that we want, only that first time. So we can install LDAP authentication for the teams, we get our puppet scripts running for the first time, we get SSLs installed, and we've still got some stuff that's running just on basic shell scripts that we just run a quick wget, pulls them down, installs them, boxes up in about three to four minutes, and they are ready to go. If they, and if teams have checks already, they can dump them on there, and they are good to go. So we felt pretty awesome after deploying all of that, and we had it running a test. Everything was great. Then we decided, hey, let's break it. We found uh, one interesting bug that we did not think of when we initially had our instances installed in our test environment. Um, we had 
Rabbit installed on their own servers, and so we had the Sensu cluster and HAProxy and KeepAliveD living what we thought was happily on two different servers. But what we found was is that KeepAliveD, when it would fail over to the secondary box, would, the secondary box would be like, sweet, I have the VIP now. That IP route sure looks sweet to go over that VIP to connect to Redis and to, Rab and to everything else. So I'm going to use that. Well, KeepAliveD on box one comes back up, it, box two does not care. It would still attempt to connect to that VIP for 15 minutes before a timeout occurred. So as you probably saw in the, in, in the infrastructure before, we broke that into its own KVM instance. Um, it was something that we tracked down. We tried changing IP routing, but at the end of the day, it's just easier to have them live on their own instances and not worry about it. So at GoDaddy, we do use LDAP for our authentication. So our security team definitely wanted LDAP on that. So we figured, no problem, we'll front it with Nginx or Lighty. It won't be a big deal, we'll get LDAP running. Well, Nginx doesn't you have LDAP built in. So we built in the module, got it installed. We thought everything was great, configured it the way that we had Lighty configured when we were testing it in test. But for whatever reason, we came across a bug in Nginx's LDAP authentication that instead of using our service account that should auth over to our active directory systems, it was trying to use my authentication to auth into active directory to search for me. That did not work. So it would not allow us to log in. So that was a day down the drain. So hey, Lighty, we already had that up and running in test. We like it. Sure, it's, you know, we kind of decided we wanted Nginx. But who cares, because this is my part of the project, and I'm not spending another day on this. So Lighty got in. I put it out into the production systems that we had running at that point with about 1,500 hosting uh, boxes on there. And I said, hey, it's working. You've got LDAP. Why does it take 10 seconds for Uchiwa to show me my events? So Lighty doesn't forward WebSockets. OK. Lighty doesn't forward WebSockets. Nginx had that. Um, so we'll just add the module for Lighty for WebSockets. The module for WebSockets for Lighty is not built to the latest version of Lighty. Cool. Let's redo everything. So we finally got that working. I test it. I am a Firefox user. Works brilliantly. Here from across the room, bullshit. And I'm like, what do you mean? Okay, go to his computer. Five, ten seconds to load. All right, pull up your network tab here in Chrome. Yeah, Chrome doesn't forward authorization over WebSockets. All right, back to Lighty. No more authorization over the WebSockets port. Use Uchiwa's key stores that they use to auth WebSockets, and we're golden. That was the worst week I have had on this project, and um, hopefully we will soon have Lighty and these configs up online, so if anybody has to go through the hell of doing this, you can just download it, because when we went to... Um, sent to themselves in their IRC, they said, use Nginx. And I'm like, well, Nginx doesn't have LDAP. Shrug, I've never used Lighty. All right, cool. So that is uh, the issues that we found there. So those were the two biggest issues. Everything else ran brilliantly. So we didn't really have any complaints there. So since we have multiple teams that we're trying to get checks for, how do we keep them organized? So we broke it down to the fact that we have certain checks that we consider enterprise checks, things like disk space, CPU health, memory, uh, monitoring the hardware, everything like that. So we dumped that into a single Git repo, called it enterprise checks. Each team then gets their own team checks, and those are all just stored in our internal Git. So what we did was, is we have a system that will automatically pull the new checks every two minutes onto the Sensu servers. It's not really scalable for the clients when we have thousands and only have about 16 servers right now for Sensu. So we recommend that they deploy theirs out via RPM or by installing them via something like a Jenkins script if that's how they want things done. Um, but that will basically then go through, restart the server, restart the clients. Everything's great. Uh, then the, the ch we also have checks that verify, verify that the teams, because they own their boxes, are actually running our enterprise checks. So that the email team that always has high CPU doesn't magically have regular CPU one day because they said no to the CPU checks. So we have our own Sensu servers that go out and pull 
the Uchiwa API to make sure that those checks are still active on all those boxes. So that's part of monitoring the monitors. So each server them itself runs a client which dumps into their, the instance of that team's Uchiwa because we want them to be aware if they make a change to their own server that they um, made a change that broke something. So we also have the checks in the enterprise repo, like I said. Um, we have push notifications to Slack, which we use internally. Um, I hope you guys all got a chance to see what teams we use now that they've fixed that bug. Um, and uh, the on-call system that we use, which I had written for the iTalk, basically says, hey, I'm a ticket. Where do I go? And routes that so that at least our knock was automated. Um, we also push data for all of our metrics into Graphite. That's something that we're still actively looking into the best way to do it. Um, today we're actually using uh, Vulture for our Graphite instances, and it is running amazingly well. We have not been able to tip that over yet. Um, and we also have Elasticsearch where we're dumping all of our logs to so we can see everything. It gives us real good visibility into seeing like, hey, why aren't these metrics running the way we think? Oh, let's go look at what changed. Let's go look at the logs. Oh, hey, spike in the logs. What's going on? And um, it has, uh, has worked out really well for actually monitoring the monitoring system, something that sadly we have not had in the past until the knock would call us and say it was down. So that's got us all set up, and we were pretty excited about it. We're still very excited about it, making improvements to it every day, getting more teams on board and everything like that. But we are seeing some benefits already. For the first time since I've worked at GoDaddy, and I've been there seven years, people care about their monitoring. So people did not care before. But today, I have people coming up to me and asking to be put ahead of other teams to get onboarded onto Sensu, as opposed to waiting to January. The thing makes it extremely simple to monitor. The check that you saw was a basic Ruby script living on the server. You can run it in Shell. You can do... Python, you can do whatever you want. If it's a script and it can run, it will monitor it. As long as it can pass back to standard out and it can read through it. Um, so we've also had issues where we were uh, able to tweak checks during an actual outage so that we could do some dig uh, deeper digging. So that's another thing that we've never had before was the ability to just spawn a check on the fly that we only care about for the next two hours while we're fixing something and then kill it afterwards because we don't need it. And with the Graphite uh, being out there and the Elk stack, it was, has been a lot easier to uh, see data. Um, we have had, at, had Graphite in the past. It uh, was at a 30 second resolution. We now have a five second resolution on the systems so we can actually see what's going on instead of a mean average over 30 seconds. Um, so moving forward, we want to do more teams, better test environment so we can monitor our test environments. People can say, like, hey, I'm deploying this code today. Should I push it to production? No, because your CPU is now running at 80%, and you had no idea because you didn't check your server. Um, better automation around everything. We, like I said, we're still running some shell scripts. There's some manual processes that we make look really fancy while we're deploying these things and execs are watching, but there is still some manual work that we want to automate. Um, we're going to continue digging into it. We have not yet tipped over Graphite on Vulture, have not tipped over Elasticsearch, and uh, we haven't tipped over Sensu outside of the issues we've had. We want to blow it up, see why it does that, and fix it. Um, and we want more automatic remediation. You guys saw the one where you could restart a service. We want more of that. We want to know why we're calling our guys 10 times a day to do something that a machine should do. And then once we get that, we can tell that guy to go fix it so that the machine doesn't have to do it 10 times a day. But that is basically our Sensu infrastructure that we have for now. Um, like I said, we're going to be making a lot of changes. Um, we have garage.godaddy.com if you guys want to see what's going on. Um, we're going to start writing articles, putting stuff that's more in depth than what I was able to put up here, more white papers out there and kind of discuss what we're doing, what we're finding. And as we find statistics on the hardware and things like that, putting some numbers out there behind it so we can you know, share with the community. But um, that's all I've got. Does anyone have any questions, feedback, anything like that? You mentioned using uh, multiple instances, sensitive, sensitive. Uh, so that was that how you would be handling multiple data centers, yeah. uh, different geographical locations, things like that? Yeah. So the, the infrastructure that you saw there is per data center, and we can uh, scale that out as much as we need to. Um, we will actually have 
eight physical boxes um, and four physical rabbit boxes in our Buckeye data center by the end of the year for all the teams there. And then our hosting team, which has servers overseas, they will have instances in Singapore, Amsterdam, um, and here in Arizona. Um, and then we'll use Uchiwa to pull it over. Um, we didn't want to do uh, Rabbit uh, overseas, so we wanted to keep everything local, and that allows us to do that. And their config management, they just plug into those servers and do what they were already doing. It's just another few servers for it to do. Why did you want to have Rabbit distributed? Um, well, Rabbit will be uh, distributed out to the other data centers. Oh, okay. We didn't want to do, uh, what I mean by overseas is we didn't want to have, ra the original plan before I got on the team was that we were going to do Rabbit, um, a central, just giant Rabbit cluster. Um, but just the latency over that would have killed it. So um, we were like, no, we're not doing that. So we will have Rabbit physical boxes in each data center that we service. Instead, you message storage for you if, if there's an issue that comes back up. Yeah. And your applications on your Yeah, especially when uh, we have the issues that one provider has an outage and the other provider has maintenance and neither of them say anything. And oh God, where did Singapore go? So. For your for your front end, um, if you had a data, if you had a knock in you know, directly in Singapore, mm -hmm. they could be connecting directly to the dashboard there. Yep. And uh, so the other thing is, if you have an outage like that, the people who are on site can be seeing a twenty nine mobile even if it's mostly telling them, you know, pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's another thing that we wanted is we wanted to scale this out uh, as much as we could to different areas. Um, so geographically, we will have backups whenever our East Coast data center goes online um, so that we have Arizona. If something happens to Arizona, we have East Coast and just route the other way to it. So even our NOC here could see those types of things, hopefully. Thank you very much.